I, um, I chose this topic a, long, a while back, uh, several, several months ago, and I chose it for a lot of reasons. I didn't start out as a scholar writing about issues like this, but through many years of teaching a course called Sex, Gender, and Christian Ethics at SLU, every spring I taught it with my undergraduate students, I came into more and more consciousness of the problem of sexual violence in part through the stories of the students who came to me. And so I had to incorporate more of that into the course, and I found myself eventually um, needing to write about it. Um, I also, in the course of teaching that class, found it necessary eventually to bring clergy sexual abuse into the course. And David Clausey, who was the national executive director of SNAP, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, is in St. Louis. And so I asked him to come to my class one year and he told his story there of being sexually abused by a priest when he was 11 years old. That's the first time I'd heard a story like that face to face, um, which is, was the same for hearing my students' stories. Um, and after that I knew I had to invite him back every year. He said it was the only Catholic campus he got invited to speak at, at least at that time. And those conversations transformed my research agenda as well. So I have been thinking about this a lot, and I've been thinking about it especially in the context of the Me Too movement, which was revived in the fall of 2017. And I've also been worried about how silent Catholics have been in the context of that movement. So I, I, I have the experience of being at a women's march in St. Louis, carrying a sign, Catholic and feminist, Me Too, Church Too, and having people look at me going, what? is she talking about and why is she here, right? <laughs> what is going on? Um, and they could be forgiven because really there weren't that many Catholics at that march. Right? But I had no idea when I chose the topic. You guys, there, come, come, there, there are seats. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or there, but that's less scary. I had no idea that there would be a resurgence of the clergy sexual abuse crisis over the summer that would put this issue on our radar. I had no idea that we would today be watching and listening to the, to the testimony of Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Brett Kavanaugh, who was actually a classmate of mine, part of the class of 1987 at Yale, also Debbie Ramirez, a classmate of mine. I, I don't think I remember either of them well. Right? But it's eerie <laughs> to see them and other classmates being talked about in the pages of the New York Times and across the country. So I'm glad we're here. Um, I'm glad we're here talking about sexual violence and social justice right now, about what's being revealed <coughs> at this moment in the culture and in the church, as hard as it is, as hard as it is. The Me Too movement that was regenerated, re-inspired re in October of this year with the Harvey Weinstein story from the New York Times has dramatically increased our intentions and our focus and I would argue our understanding of sexual violence. And it just keeps going and it's led to an awful lot of revelations, an awful lot of widespread support as expressed in the hashtags Believe Women and Time's Up. It has, to this point, not resulted in major legal changes, policy changes, structure, structural changes, but yet something is going on. At the very least, a new conversation is going on. I would argue that part of that conversation is not just the most egregious kinds of violations, but also what is more broadly being called bad sex. That is stories like we heard, there was a viral story um, from the New York Times Magazine called Cat Woman, uh, Cat Person, sorry, Cat Person, um, about a woman talking about an awful night with a man that wasn't exactly violation, but also wasn't wasn't good in any sense and seemed to be following the script of a pornography film. She told this, this was a fictional story and women shared it widely and kept saying, me too, me too, this is common, this is ordinary, this isn't, this isn't strange. Similarly, a season sorry and the outing of, of, of um, of him by a woman that he dated, a similar kind of story, 
also the New York Times did a big um, spread on sex on campus in which they invited men and women on college campuses to tell them about sex and got story after story after story of, again, yes, violations, but also a lot of bad sex. That is sex that was not respectful or loving or just in any sense of the word. And over and over we heard stories where there were scripts of domination and submission and women compelled to stay in the room with men, not necessarily forced, but something, something is keeping them in the room even when they would rather leave. And of course, as we know from the hashtag church too, churches and religious people have been inspired to say, it happens here too, okay? It happens in our doors too. We're part of the problem. And when we ha hear these stories that happen in our own midst and, in, and here in your midst here in, in Pennsylvania, um, we also feel uh, anger and betrayal and despair about this problem that is, is ours too. So I want to consider with you what kind of problem is this? Right. And I, I want to argue that it's not just a legal problem and it's not just a personal problem, but rather it's a social problem. And because it's a social problem that tangles together violation, violence, bad sex, and structures that enable all of that, we have to respond to it with social justice. We need to look at the cultural forces that sustain this problem. And I believe that Catholic social thought has the resources to develop that kind of response. But so far, we haven't made that case. Not at all. So today what I want to do is unpack the limited Catholic engagement, highlight the resources that Catholic social thought brings to the table, and suggest that if we act in what I call in other places the space between the personal and the political, we can do two things. We can move forward in this movement, and we can also bring people on the right and the left who are currently polarized together in shared action. That's my plan. Right. So first, what's behind the Catholic silence? Imagine with me for a moment if Catholics had, been, had approached this problem as they approach immigration. We know where to go in our scripture. We have a long history of Catholic social thought stretching way back. We can call it up. We can make YouTube videos. James Martin can give us the five points, right? We, we have bishops speaking out. We have bishops at the border. We can advocate on DACA. We can have statements, protests, prayer vigils, teach-ins, right? No confusion about where the church stands. That doesn't mean Catholics all agree. Right? But no confusion about where the Catholic Church stands on immigration or why it matters or why it's fundamental to Catholic identity. We know what the claims are. There's a duty, a duty to welcome, a right to migrate. Right? It's not ambiguous. It's not worrisome, despite the fact that it's controversial. Right? We wade right in because this is the right thing to do. And yet, that's not what's going on here. No major statements, no teach-ins, no prayer vigils, no widespread education campaign, no advocacy on legislation, right? We're not major players on this major social issue. Why? I have three, three interrelated reasons um, on your handout there, justice, gender, and the clergy sexual abuse crisis. First, justice. Immigration is a justice issue. Right, and we speak out on it using our language of Catholic social thought and the language of justice. The problem is that traditionally in Catholic social thought, we bifurcate the ethics. We've got personal ethics on the one hand, which mostly means sex, and sexual ethics on the other hand. And we talk about justice, and we, social ethics, and we talk about love, mercy, sometimes purity or chastity, sexual ethics, but not so much justice. Right? And that holds for marriage and family as well. This, this division is problematic. Right? It, it doesn't serve us well because we, 
we have a hard time talking about justice when it comes to sex, marriage, and family. So think about that with regard to sex outside marriage, for instance. In our tradition, it's very clear that it's unethical. But once it's happening, we don't have a whole lot to say about the different ways in which it might be unethical. And we can't really engage in that conversation because we put it off to the side in the unethical realm. So we don't end up talking much about justice violations that happen in sex outside of marriage. Right? We aren't players in that conversation. We've staked out our territory and we've cut off a uh, discussion on the other kinds of issues that go on. That's actually true, I would say, in marriage as well. Right? We can talk a lot and we talk way better than we used to about what good sex in marriage looks like. We have Pope John Paul II's language of the theology of the body and total self-gift. We have really beautiful language. Francis has added to it in Amoris Laetitia. But the problem is that that language of oneness and belonging that makes so much sense in a good sexual relationship, in a good marriage, right? doesn't seem to allow for the potential of violation or bad sex or injustice. And so we lack the language to talk about justice violations that happen within marriage. And we had uh, major synods in the church recently in 2014 and 2015, in which the Vatican gathered together the world's bishops and asked them what they thought the bigot problems were. And there was some discussion in those synods on the family on domestic violence, sexual violence. It was one of many problems that were part of the context that was being addressed. But what we remember about the synod, synod is much more controversial discussions about divorce and remarriage and communion, possibly homosexuality, <laughs> rather than sexual or domestic violence. Francis makes progress in Amoris Laetitia. I would argue that we, he gives us the strongest language we've ever heard about domination and violation in marriage. He says it in several different places. He talks about this as a, pervasive, as a pervasive problem and says that sexual violence is a fundamental distortion of marriage. And I think that's notable because although it's true that he repeats Catholic teaching on same-sex marriage and on contraception, he only uses that very strong term, <coughs> fundamental distortion, to talk about sexual violence. That's important. He still doesn't use the, 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 the language of justice, uh, but it's close. And there's potential there for advocacy, but unrealized. It's not where the priority is. The second, the problem of gender. On the one hand, there's been a great deal of progress in Catholic social thought when it comes to gender. I like to have my students read earlier Catholic documents in which we have clear demarcations between men are the head of the family and women are the heart. The feminist movement is really leading women astray. Women's work outside the home is really problematic. Right? These kinds of statements that we had in the 1930s, that's not where we are anymore. And yet our teaching is ambiguous. We say yes to women's rights, to equality, equal dignity to some forms of feminism, qualification. But we're also, Pope Francis has been critical of what he calls gender ideology. Not completely clear what that means, right? But possibly, <laughs> but possibly um, gender fluidity, possibly the idea that gender is socially constructed. And there, there's room for conversation on those kinds of issues. But what's problematic is that in questioning gen feminism and gender ideology, and also um, <coughs> along with that, celebrating feminine genius and virtues, virtues which tend to cohere with a vision of femininity that is self-giving, self-effacing, putting my own needs and desires aside so that I can serve others, qualities that can be very good and necessary in certain contexts can also be problematic when we read them in terms of pro potential injustices, potential violence. And so we, we deal with victims of sexual violence as people who are wounded who need our mercy, but we don't necessarily think about injustice and how we can advocate for the oppressed 
the way that we do for, say, migrants. So the potential to speak out is lost. And of course, the elephant in the room, right? The real reason that we can't talk about Me Too is because of our own crisis. When our failures are exposed right in the middle of this big cultural moment, how can we get up and speak, right? So when Pope Francis really misspoke, to say the least, in Chile in the summer, right in the middle of this, seeming to question the testimony of victims. Right? Right? Now he corrected it, he walked back, he met with victims, he sent, sent um, an emissary to talk to the bishops. Many of the bishops have now resigned. Looks better, but it was a bad misstep. Then came McCarrick. Right? And we know that in, uh, now that in our <coughs> own seminaries, we have this pervasive problem. And that this cardinal, former Cardinal McCarrick enjoyed a very high level public role for a very long time. Not long after he had stopped doing what he was doing, but with a lot of people knowing and choosing to turn away. Right? Again, he stepped down. But what's been revealed there is deeply problematic. And then the Pennsylvania J Grand Jury Report. Prior to that, the World Meeting of Families in Ireland. Also, while they were trying to have a good World Meeting of Families inside, the protesters outside kept drawing attention not only to LGBTQ issues, but also to the problem of clergy sexual abuse in Ireland. And we know that the doors have just not yet been open in India, in Africa, in South America, and these things will continue to come to the fore. So how can we talk when we haven't dealt with the problem ourselves? There are common things in these different, in these different crises. We have stories that are not just of the abuse and the violation themselves, but of silencing, of shame, and of systemic attempts to cover up what was done and ignore what was done. So we have been limited by our own ongoing problems, our uncritical gender analysis, lack of attention to sexual injustice. So we've not contributed, but we could, but we could. The three concepts that I think are really helpful from Catholic social thought may not sound like much up front, but I actually think there's a lot here that could be potentially very helpful. Human dignity, social sin, and solidarity. Human dignity is, by any measure, the core of Catholic social thought. It's something that both Catholic progressives, Catholic conservatives agree on. Nobody's against it. We all like it. <laughs> but what does it mean? Right? John Paul II makes a big claim in Centesimus Honest in that um, document, The Hundred Years After Rerum Novarum, when he says that this is, this is the core. And he goes back to the, the, the first document of Catholic social thought, Rerum Novarum, 1890s, and says, look at Leo XIII. People criticized him for speaking out against the abuses of workers in factories. And they said, that's not what the church is supposed to do. The church is supposed to talk about religious stuff, not, not workers' rights. And he said, no, this, these are human dignity violations, and we have to speak out, right? The violations <coughs> compel a response. Because we care about human persons, we can't not speak out. So we went back to that, that analysis of Leo the Thirteenth and Rerum Navarum. And in that document, he's talking about just wages, which most people know. And he says that you have to pay people just wages or else you're violating their human dignity. OK, but why? So he's, he, he knows that other people are saying that, well, if they consented, note this issue, this word, consent. If they consented to the wages, well, then there's no violation. But Leo says, no. <laughs> right? Work is not simply an exchange of time for money in which if I consent, it's just. That's contractual justice. Work is, comes from the person. And there's this quote I have on the handout where he says, the force which acts, which is the, the power that comes out of the worker, is bound up with the personality and is the exclusive property of the one who acts. When I work, my very self is engaged in the work. I'm not just selling my labor. It's not a commodity. 
And what that means is that natural justice demands na natural justice demands that workers be paid for that work so that they can live. Work is personal and necessary, and so a just wage is required. And if somebody, because they're forced or they need to accept something else, that doesn't mean it's just, right? That means that person is the victim of fear and injustice. And so if you do that, if you're an employer and you do that, then that is a crime that cries to the avenging anger of heaven. It's a famous phrase from Ram Navar. Right. I think that's important. It's not just a contract violation. It's not just if you consent, it's OK. So today, feminists are telling us that that's what's going on with sexual violence. Right? It's not just that she said yes, and so it's OK, or she didn't say no loud enough. Consent isn't the measure of justice. Rather, there's an exchange going on here that involves something of the person. And that's what's being violated. Right? That's why it is something that cries to the avenging anger of heaven. That's true with the clear violations with the Harvey Weinsteins. But it's also clear with bad sex because the violation occurs even when women aren't forced to stay because they're not being treated as full persons. So even though it's pressure that keeps them in the room, some of the pressure which is in their own heads in the form of internalized impression, right? That's there, right? Even still, when they're accepting what is not desirable they've, because they've agreed to the terms of engagement, they've agreed to the contract, that's still problematic in terms of sec Catholic social thought. So both sexual assault and bad sex violate dignity. They deny the reality of the person as a body and a spirit. And this is what I think the Me Too movement has not yet been willing to say. It's not just because you didn't ask, right? It's because there's something more fundamental going on. And that's why the suffering can be so profound. That's why it can be so traumatic in body and soul. So viewed through the lens of Catholic social thought with sex and labor, persons are objectified and harmed through these different kinds of justice violations. But the violations aren't just personal, they're social. <coughs> right? So when we talk about economic injustice and Catholic social thought, we say, yes, there's, there's structural sin, but persons participate in it. Persons cooperate with it. And even if there isn't a specific act that we can identify, even if I can't actually draw a line and say, it's when I buy from that store or when I pay this wage that I cooperate with that system, it's harder to trace. Even still, you can't totally disentangle the personal sin from the social sin. That's what enables social sin, personal sin. But the structures also make the personal sin possible. There are certain things that we engage in, even if we would rather not, because there don't seem to be other options. The structures box us in. Right? And feminism, what, what feminists are doing is showing us that sexual violence, too, is a kind of social sin. They're illuminating the social structures within which sexual relationships take place. So one Christian the feminist theologian, Karen LaBox, for instance, writes this article, it's a couple decades old, called Love Your Enemies. And she, and she starts it with a letter from Dear Abby, where somebody writes in and says, my, uh, I, I know this story where a, a woman slept with a man on a first date, but then on the second date, he overpowered her. Is that rape? Okay. And LaBox says, notice the confusion. Is forced sex sex or is it rape? Why is the woman confused? Right? Perhaps the man was also confused. Right? I'm absolutely convinced that in many, many cases, especially in our college campuses, in which women walk out feeling violated, men have no idea. Right? Because of the structures, because of the scripts that are internalized, that's what LaBox is talking about. So she's saying we, can, we don't just root out this problem by saying we're going to be really hard on the people who violate. We have to look at the structure that makes all of this possible and even in its less egregious forms, ordinary, right? Ordinary, right? We can, we can perhaps see it better when we look at something like 
the sexual abuse of domestic workers, hotel workers, sex workers. There we see these systems. Why is it that women in Taiwan are sex workers? One theologian, Asian theologian wants to know. Well, they, they, they claim that they're choosing it in a sense, but, but they say that it's just short term when it's really not. They don't have any choice, right? They're not really making a choice any more than the worker is making a choice to accept an unjust wage and terrible working hours and bad conditions. Right? They're there, right? They're there because of the structure. Right? Or we can look at domestic workers in the Philippines who endure along with bad conditions, sorry, Filipino domestic workers are working, at, working in, um, in, in other countries. They endure all kinds of abuse in the form of unwanted touching and even to some who become virtual sexual slaves. Filipino theologian Gemma Tr Cruz writes about this. Why? Well, look at the structure, right? They're forced to leave their country because of economic inequality. Their women are thought to be the right ones to do the domestic work because of our ideas about gender. And so they leave their homes, they leave their families, they go to Europe, to other places, and live in people's homes. And somehow there's a sense of entitlement that allows their bosses to think that along with the cleaning and the cooking and everything else that goes on, that they're allowed to touch these workers as they see fit. So there's a kind of commodification that goes on. Right? a sense that this is my domestic worker, or Cruz says, my <coughs> Filipino, right? That enables and sustains this violence in an unthinkable way. It's not just terrible, monstrous violators. This is ordinary and pervasive, right? So with Catholic social thought, then, we can see, we can see what social sin looks like without saying, the fact that we're calling it a structure means that we're denying personal sin. Personal sin is still a part of it. <laughs> we're still sustaining it, but we can't disentangle it completely from social sin. Right. Finally, solidarity. There's a lot of talk in the culture about solidarity. Right. It's always then good to go back to John Paul II's famous quote from Solicitudo Re Socialis in which he says that, that solidarity isn't just a vague feeling of compassion, right? It's not just a hashtag. It's not just a like. It's not just a feeling, right? But it is, but it starts with a feeling. It starts with a feeling. That's not a bad place to start. But then it requires a conversion. And part of what it's a conversion to is a vision of interdependence. And that's where we start with, with solidarity, a vision of interdependence that says, it's not that I, I choose to be in solidarity, but I am in solidarity. I am connected to all the people, especially to, and, and especially to the ones who are vulnerable on the bottom. So it starts with that interdependence. But then, as Catholic social thought develops, and Megan Clark, uh, who teaches at St. John's University, shows this in her work on solidarity and Catholic social thought. It develops into a virtue, right? So solidarity as a virtue. And what that means is that it now becomes a positive duty, but not one that I sort of um, say, I've, 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 I've done that. I've got, I've got the solidarity thing down. But rather, because it's a virtue, it's something that we work on over time, and we're never totally done with. <laughs> and we grow into it. But with a virtue, right, you can't be virtuous just by saying that you're virtuous. You have to do, get there more through your actions. And so as, as Catholic thought, social thought gets clearer on what solidarity is, we think about it more as a virtue that requires action, and particularly action to promote the dignity of others and work for their human rights and accompany them. Right. That might be helpful when we're thinking, where do we go? with the Me Too movement. Where do we go now? So sexual violence read through the lens of Catholic social thought can't be separated from social structures or seen as anything less than a violation of human dignity, not in the Philippines or Thailand, not in Hollywood or Washington, D.C. or Pennsylvania or St. Louis. There are structures that interlock everywhere, and we have a similar narrative of, of a socially coerced division of body and spirit 
on the part of perpetrator and victim, division of body and spirit that results in objectification and violation. Right? And then we have then there's and there is a clear duty of solidarity to do something. But what? What worries me right now about the, the, the conversation on sexual violence is the intense division. I try very hard to read uh, news stories on, uh, on different sides and to follow lots of, a diverse crowd on Twitter, which is not always a fun thing to do, those of you on Twitter know. <laughs> Um, but it's important, and the narratives are very different. I read the New York Times yesterday about Kavanaugh. I read the Wall Street Journal yesterday about Kavanaugh. It's a very, two very different countries, right? And we can go, we can do that. Um, we, can, we can divide <coughs> like that. Um, but I, I'm not sure that's helpful on most issues, and I sure don't think it's helpful on this one. My, my sense also is that so, so there's, there's this polarization. And it also seems that the Me Too movement, for all the good that it's brought, is, is, is stuck in a sense. Um, that we've outed and we've called for consent and we've called for believing women. Not sure what we do now. Because I'm not sure we're at the root of it. Right? If consent is not the root of it, Completely. If it's bigger than that, then we have a lot more work to do. But if, but if social ethics and personal ethics are connected, and if there are dysfunctional cultural narratives that enable and sustain abuse, even abuse by good people, people who do other good things in their lives, right? then we have some work to do. And theologians and others who care about Catholic social thought can be involved in that kind of work. So here I turn to, to, to two sources that, that are somewhat unusual, um, perhaps in reading in, in, um, in Catholic social thought. One is a black feminist lesbian poet, Audre Lorde, who's not Catholic. Um, but there's something about Lorde that I think is really important. I always read her essay on the power of the erotic, which I highly recommend to you with my students. What's important about Lord's work is that she sees the erotic not just as sexual desire, but as a powerful life force central to the person. It's the same force that, that inspires sexual passion that also inspires a passion to, she says, resist conformity. It's the same power that draws people into intimacy and into community. That, ask, that causes them to demand justice. It's all one powerful, passionate force. And she says, once you've felt that, right? once you know what that means, you don't want to go back. You want to demand that in all of your life pursuits. You want to feel in accord with that joy that you're capable of. And you want that for other people, too. Why is that important? I, I think if we could put Catholic language on that thought, it, it speaks to the wholeness of the person, to the unity of body and soul, and to the idea that the reality of human persons as body and souls demands a response. It demands an encounter, not just consent, not just not to be harmed. So then if we look at Catholic ethicist, um, Yale professor Margaret Farley and her writing in Just Love, we see the same kind of thing. Now, what Farley's ethic is, is broadly um, significant right now in Catholic theological circles, but most people talk about how important it is that she, she has principles of respect and equality and consent and do no harm. And those are all really important baselines for sexual ethics. But ultimately, Farley wants a lot more than that, right? So she wants at least that, and that's helpful, right? Let's start there. Um, but she defines human persons with help from, not so much from Catholic social thought, but from Kant and other, and other thinkers. She defines human persons as embodied spirits and spirited bodies, right? And she says these 
persons as body and spirit deserve, yes, not to be harmed, not to be touched without their consent, but also deserve more. Ultimately, they deserve relationships of mutuality, of giving and receiving, which is not going on in cat person or all of these incidents of bad sex, right? Of honesty and intimacy, that are relationships that are personal, personally satisfying and also overflowing. And she says that only a sexuality that's formed and shaped with love is the possibility of integration into the whole of the human personality. Only relationships that engage persons in their full reality are fully just. And if you want to work for social justice, you need to pay attention to the forces that make that possible. So like, she might be surprised about this, but like Leo XIII and John Paul II, Margaret Fowley, all in the same room, right? <laughs> she wants more than autonomy and contractual justice, right? That's the baseline. She has a unified vision of the human being, of body and spirit, personal and political, free and relational. Person's not just free, but also relational. And that's why social, sexual violence <laughs> is wrong. And that's why good sex demands is much more demanding than consent because we're free and relational beings. What she wants is flourishing. And by the way, I think that's what John Paul II wants too, right? But, right, to get that, if social justice includes that, uh, that doesn't come about through a legal or political system primarily. Not to take away from that work. When I sometimes say not just the legal, my critics um, get a little bit worried that Julie doesn't care about politics. And it is true. I was a political science major. I left that behind. And I think that there are other ways to solve problems. But I'm not leaving it behind. I just want to say there's more. And the, the, there's more um, needs to happen in the space between. So I draw upon here um, someone I greatly admire, Brian Stevenson, African-American lawyer and advocate for justice in the, crim in the criminal justice system. And even Brian Stevenson right, says, yes, the policy work. Yes, the laws have to change. But you have to do the narrative work, too, because that's what changes hearts and minds. That's the work that Catholic social thought and theology can do. Right? And that's, so we can start a new conversation that's about the narrative. And we can do that in what I call the space between not just one-to-one, -one, and not just at the level of policy, but in, in churches and in schools and in other social spaces, even social media spaces, where conversations go on. But we can't leave that conversation <coughs> if we refuse to talk about sexual violation and bad sex in and out of marriage as violations of justice. We can't have that conversation if we refuse to name that we have been engaged, not just, not just some bad people in the church, but we have been engaged in social sin in the church, in the sustaining of a culture and a system in which sex and violence flourished, in which perpetrators were passed around and promoted. It's not just about the three or four or maybe six or nine percent of priests who are abusers, but about the many more who turned away and who knew and who let it happen, didn't make this a priority, and bishops. Right? So we refuse, we, we, so we, and not if we refuse to commit to solidarity. And solidarity right now, it looks, it's going to mean a lot of self-scrutiny and a lot of openness to reform with the help of people inside and outside the church. The Me Too movement is to end sexual violence is drawing attention to a pervasive sexual problem. What an opportunity. What an opportunity to talk about problematic cultures in Catholic high schools and Catholic colleges and outside and in workplaces and everywhere else. What a time to discuss <coughs> masculinity, femininity, class divides, narrative of sex as conquest, etc. All these things that pervade our institutions. What if 
we could talk about that? What if we could help people begin to talk about sex that is just and loving and respectful of persons? Because we have a lot of narratives now of what that doesn't look like. We have very few of what it does look like. What if we could help reduce violence and bad sex and promote justice and good sex? While so far Catholics have remained on the sidelines, I think the tradition has some resources to offer. A Catholic social justice analysis points us toward long and slow work of changing deeply entrenched cultural narratives that shape problematic practices that ultimately harm both women and men. So hopefully, if we have the courage to work on our internal stuff, the hashtag church2 can come to mean not only that we're complicit, which we are, in sexual violence, but that Catholics are willing to be self-critical so that we can shape a new conversation about sex for the embodied and spirited persons who have every right to expect more than violence and bad sex. So, thank you.